I got a call on the very next morning, Monday morning, just to tell me that I was a name that had come up and they wanted, Cyclona wanted to do a phone interview with me, mm -hmm. but the search firm made it clear, Shane, it's going to be really, really hard for you to get this job. <laughs> you must have crushed that phone interview. <laughs> I, I think so. Um, I hope so. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Next Up podcast. I'm Adam Brenneman. Today, we are in Columbia, South Carolina at the University of South Carolina, sitting in the team meeting room, about to talk to South Carolina head football coach Shane Beamer, one of the best young innovative head coaches in the country. Actually the first head coach to say yes to coming on this podcast. So shout out to Coach Beamer, excited to talk to him about his career, how he got to this point, all things South Carolina football, NIL transfer portal, gonna talk about it all. Before we get there, please subscribe to this podcast, like, comment, and share the podcast. All your support allows me and my video team to travel around the country and get on great guests. So please hit that subscribe button, support us, help us help you get better content. Let's go talk to Coach Beamer. Next up. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, how are they yeah. doing? Doing well. Appreciate you? doing this. I'm yeah, great. Absolutely. Great. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks so for having us. Chris. How are you? Good. Chris? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Chris. Nice, nice to meet you. Yeah, what did you say, Jim? Steven. Steven, pleasure. Where's home for you guys? Uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. They, they, yeah. They, oh, y'all knew each other like growing eight, up or what? Eight, eight hours uh, last night to come down. Nice. Here. What's up, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah. Good deal. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, appreciate doing this. You betcha. This will be fun. You've been, you've been doing the podcast tour a little bit lately? Is it, uh, you know, busting with the boys. Busting with the boys. So that was an experience. Um, not a ton. Only the uh, only the right ones. Yeah. For sure. So. Well, I appreciate you appreciate you saying yes. I think you were the first the first coach to actually say yes to coming on okay. on the podcast. So I had emailed uh, Steve a while ago. Yep. And, uh, and he said he said you said yes. Now we had to schedule it, but yeah. <laughs> but you're one well, of the first ones to out. say yes. So I appreciate, appreciate you, doing you coming it. down. Yeah. So yep. you, we we have some some mutual. Uh, so you know Stephen Wise, right? Yep. He worked for you. So yep. Stephen Wise was out there at, at in Arizona when I was out there. Yep. Coach Conley, you know, right? Yep. Joe Conley. He was yep. my strength coach at UMass. So they yep. all they Joe all told spent, you. Joe spent hi. some time here. Yeah. Yeah. He he uh, he told you told told me to say hi to you. Yep. Him, so. Absolutely. Yeah. How things going? Everything good. good? Yeah, it's been good. Uh, slow time right now, month yeah. of May, but it's uh, players aren't here. You got players aren't here. We got a few here that are on their own, yeah. uh, just working out on their own and things like that. But they don't come back to Memorial Day, cool. so a little bit of a slow time right now. Doing all the, the booster club circuit you, you, and all that stuff. Right, <laughs> traveling now. around the yeah. media circuit. Right? Exactly. Podcast. Yep. Right? Spoke somewhere every night last week, and I guess I got two this week, and then. Uh, one next week and then it slows down a little bit yeah. and crank up the summer camp circuit in june yeah until until july is the month off then yep. for coaches but yep. probably not much for you still recruiting yeah, re <laughs> relatively speaking because the uh because the recruiting part of it never yeah, ends you know no doubt no uh, well I, there's a, a lot i want to dive into with you yep. and uh I'm, I'm excited just because there's you know year three now mm -hmm. at, at south carolina and yep and just your journey to get here yeah. and, and how it's all went down first yep. thing is I'm curious here, what's the biggest difference now in year three mm -hmm. that's, that's changed since your first year here, when mm -hmm. you first walked in the doors and you had to reestablish the culture? What, what, what's changed between now and then? Probably just uh, guys have a better understanding of what we expect and how we want how things are done. Um, you know, year one, it seems like you were coaching up every little thing on and off the field, yeah. and there's just a better understanding from a leadership standpoint. Players know how we want things done, and they're able to – kind of police things and enforce things yeah. in the locker room a little bit better. And then and then just on the field, I would say just an understanding of, you know, how we practice and the the competitive spirit that we want to practice with, the physicality we want to practice with. Those are the things that year one, I think you were trying to teach and instill yeah, every single day. Yeah. And and now there's a better understanding of of uh, how we do things here. Yeah. When you when you got here, what's one thing that surprised you the most when you when you arrived here? Uh, the lack of confidence that our players right. had, yeah. um, uh, you know, and I get it. it they had, it, I guess it had been back to back losing seasons, but, um, that was a surprise just coming in and, and they had had some ad dealt with adversity, obviously the last couple the, the previous two seasons, mm -hmm. two back to back losing seasons. And, um, 2020 was when I got hired. That was the COVID year. <laughs> so it was kind of crazy for everybody. But just the lack of confidence, you know, guys, there wasn't a, a sense that they were very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be an SEC football program and a program that was just a couple years away from being in a bowl game mm -hmm. and things like that, that, that had good players, that was surprising. Yeah. Was there anything when you, when you took this job, obviously first time head coach, and you're at a SEC, one of the best programs in the country, 
Was there anything that you felt like you maybe weren't as prepared for as you thought you should be? And then what was maybe something that you were overly prepared for that, that mm. kind of came easy? Yeah, there was a lot that I probably wasn't <laughs> prepared for. Even, you know, having been in coaching all my life, I've been around coaching all my life because yeah. of my dad and then being in coaching as long as I had before I got the head coaching job. I probably didn't realize just the amount of stuff that you deal with as a head coach <laughs> that has just nothing to do with football. Yeah. And, you know, I got hired and there's so much to do when you get hired. So much. I mean, recruiting, hiring a staff, uh, getting to know all the players, keeping the players here, not yeah. transferring, yeah. Uh, donors, my bosses. There's just so many things. And uh, I thought I had a pretty good handle on it, pretty good plan for the first you know, first five days, first 30 days, first 60 days, all that. But that just was like just blown up <laughs> because there's there's just so many things that that uh, come across your desk. Everybody, you know, needs something and, and everybody has a question and everybody wants five or 10 minutes to visit with you about their departments, which I which is great. I respect. But it was just uh, a lot coming at me, um, a lot coming at me yeah. in a in a short period of time. And that was probably a little overwhelming. And and, and I remember, uh, you know, coach other coaches that called me and said, "Hey, I know what you're going through. You know, <laughs> nobody's ever prepared for that first day coaching job. Just hang in there, and and you'll be okay." And then, as far as over prepared, um, I don't know if there's anything I was really over prepared. Probably just a handle on how I wanted things done, and it, and it probably took a while to to get it there as you were going through as we were going through all the other stuff that I just alluded to. But yeah. there was a sense of what I wanted this program to look like, what I wanted it to feel like, what I wanted it to be like. Uh, because I had spent, you know, my entire career preparing for that moment. Okay, if I ever do get this opportunity, here's what I want it to be like. The, the, that part of that transition to be, being a head coach is what I, I'm so interested to hear more about that. Yeah. Like, how does that – when did this job first come on your radar? How mm -hmm. does that process work? And then when it comes to you get the phone call that you're getting hired, mm -hmm. how fast are you talking to recruits? I mean, you got to you got to build a staff out. You yeah. got to There's signing day deadline that you're coming up against. I mean, yeah. There's so much, like you mentioned, retention of your own roster. You got to yeah. talk to the guys before they get in the portal. Right? Yeah. No. So, like, just take take me take us through that process of how that actually yeah. goes down. No, it's it's a lot. I mean, it starts probably back in 2000, uh, seven, eight, nine, and ten when I was an assistant coach here. My wife and I loved it in Columbia. Two of our three children were born here. Loved living here. Loved coaching here with Coach Spurrier. And it's one of those situations where we left. And we always wanted to come back. So I've always had my eye, always had my eye on this South Carolina program, followed it, pulled for it, and, and always dreamed of wanting to be the head coach here. So, um, you know, certainly during the 2020 season, South Carolina was struggling. I was coaching at Oklahoma. You heard different things about the future of the program and what may or may not happen. So I was following it, you know, coaching my team, coaching the team at Oklahoma, but also following the situation here at Oklahoma, here at South Carolina. Uh, they made a change at the head coaching position on a Sunday. And then I'll be honest, I mean, immediately I was reaching out to whoever I could reach out to to just make sure that they knew that I was extremely interested in this position. I got a call on the very next morning, Monday morning, from the search firm that was going to be handling the search for this, just to tell me that I was a name that had come up and they wanted, South Carolina wanted to do a phone interview with me, mm -hmm. but the search firm made it clear, Shane, it's going to be really, really hard for you to get this job. <laughs> um, there's sitting head coaches that want this job. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of coaches that are interested in this position. It's an SEC job, but they do want to have a phone conversation with you. So that was on Monday morning. You must have crushed that phone interview. <laughs> I, I think so. Um, I hope so. Uh, I uh, We actually did the phone interview, I guess, two nights later. So it was uh, Lincoln Riley. I was coaching at Oklahoma. Lincoln was my boss. I went to Lincoln, told him what was going on, making sure he was okay with it, told him that I wasn't going to – it wasn't going to just take away from anything of our preparation at Oklahoma for what we were doing. So I did the phone interview. I think it was like 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock on a Wednesday night back in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm which was, you know, kind of after we had gotten all of our work done for the for the night uh, at OU, did the phone interview with Ray Tanner and Chance Miller, our to, uh, my two bosses here at Carolina. Uh, you know, I tell the story. I, I was in my office in Norman at, the, at Oklahoma. I had all these notes, like, spread across the desk. I uh, took everything off my desk except just notes that I wanted to talk about. And I honestly, we talked, I don't know, it's probably two hours and I don't think I ever looked at those notes one time. It was just a very 
easygoing conversation because in a lot of ways, and I know it sounds cheesy, but in a lot of ways, I've been preparing for this particular job for a long time because I had been here and I wanted to come back. Yeah. Um, and I remember afterwards getting in the car and calling my wife on the way home and saying to her, you know, I really think I may get this job. Like that interview went really, really, really well. And I had been on interviews before where, you know, sometimes uh, you feel good. Sometimes you don't feel good. But this was just was just different. That was a Wednesday I guess the following Friday, it was the day after Thanksgiving, interviewed in person uh, for the job. Uh, that was a long process. We met in Atlanta at a hotel. That was about a six hour interview, uh, very thorough, but very same thing, very confident and easy yeah. going because I wasn't talking about a program that I wasn't passionate about. I wasn't talking about a program that I didn't know anything about. I knew about this program. That was a week and a half later and then and then the hard part was at that point, you know, I keep hearing about from from people here how great I had done and that I was in the mix. But I think it was another week, a week and a half before they called and offered me the job. But it was it was funny. I had COVID when they called and offered me the job. <laughs> so I was in quarantine and it was a Saturday night and South Carolina was playing Kentucky. I had that game on television in my house, but Oklahoma was also playing. We were playing Baylor. But I couldn't coach the game go. because I had I had tested positive for COVID literally right after I had interviewed for the job here mm -hmm. and uh, went into quarantine. So the Saturday that I got offered the job, that was my last day in quarantine. And I knew that South Carolina was going to be called, was going to make a decision that night one way or another. And we were watching the Oklahoma Baylor game. We were watching the South Carolina Kentucky game. It's a weird feeling because <laughs> the team that I'm coaching is playing in a game four miles away and yeah. I'm not there, but I'm also watching this other game on television that I could be the new head coach of by the end of the night. It was just an eerie feeling. And um, phone rang about nine o'clock and it was Ray Tanner, the athletic director here at South Carolina called and, and I knew why he was calling and I'm on the edge of my seat. Cause it's, you know, it sounds it's a big thing. I mean, you see him calling, you realize your life is about to change one way or another. <laughs> yeah. And um, he made small talk for four or five minutes about Good college football man. that day. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I saw that game earlier. Yeah. And yeah, that was great too. And, and all this stuff. And then finally he said, well, are you ready to do this thing? And I told him, I said, coach, I've been waiting for my, I've been waiting for a long time to hear you say that. And didn't take me long to accept. And that was probably, shoot, that was probably nine or 10 o'clock um in in Oklahoma time and uh walked out of the room my wife and three children they were just sitting there waiting for me to come out <laughs> of the room I didn't have to say anything I just kind of shook my head yes that we got the job uh, obviously we had this huge family bear hug and was an emotional moment and a lot of fun uh, and then at that point you immediately start thinking like you said about all the things you have to get done yeah. and you don't know if the news is going to break or not in today's time there's no secret so I didn't tell anybody except my mom and dad, um, <laughs> called my parents to let them know. I think we called my in-laws to let them know. And then next thing you know, it's breaking on national media <laughs> and your phone immediately starts just yeah. blowing up with phone calls and text messages. Uh, Coach Tanner said, we want to send a plane tomorrow morning to pick you up and bring you out here to South Carolina tomorrow morning. It's going to be there at 830 or nine o'clock. <laughs> at this point, it's getting to be late. Um, computer we had to sign the term sheet so they could um so they could send the plane yeah. uh computer i forget a computer wasn't working or something so we had to call a neighbor to come over to the house <laughs> to help us with that so we could sign the term sheet and get it back in um and i don't think i really called anybody specifically about the job until the next day you know the rest of the night was just thinking about what i wanted to say to the team the next day what i needed to get done in columbia that day when i got there hopped on a plane on sunday morning and got over here and and then dove head first into it so your press conference was that next day it was the uh the it after. was the monday got it so i got the job saturday night sunday morning got on got on a plane uh flew over here first thing i did was come straight to the facility mm -hmm. and then all i did the rest of the day on sunday was i met with every coach that was in the program here um, just to kind of tell them where they stood because I've been a part of a transition before where the head coach never met with the existing staff. He sent the athletic director in and the athletic director said he doesn't want to keep any of you guys except he does want to meet with you, you and you tomorrow. And I just thought that was 
bull crap. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I've been on the other side of it. If I ever get a head coaching job, I'm gonna at least gonna take time to sit down with the coaches and have a conversation with them. And either, hey, I, I'm interested in talking to you. I want you to stay, or I've got some other body, somebody else in mind. If I can help you in any way, let me know. So I did that all day Sunday uh, in my office. I met with the team um, as well. So the very first team meeting, just to introduce myself. That was Sunday, and then the rest of that day was like recruiting calls. And then the next morning, or the next day is when that Monday is when we did the press conference on that Monday. It's a whirlwind, man. Recru it is recruiting the day after. <laughs> they don't give me a lot it's of time, crazy. time to get ready. I, huh? I, I kid, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I kid. Like I, I came over here and had a meeting with the team, met with all the coaches. Finally, it's like whatever time at night, and I'm driving. I'm a zombie at this point, <laughs> and I'm I'm driving back to the hotel. And one of the current players on the team, he call, he's on the South Carolina team, and he calls to tell me that he's decided to enter the NFL draft. And I'm like, I haven't even met you. Like, <laughs> can we at least, like, talk? And, and uh, it was Ernest Jones who's playing for the Rams now. Yeah. So congrats. I mean, he's had a great career, but it was just like a whirlwind. <laughs> you know, like I got players telling me they're going to the NFL draft. I don't know anybody. It's uh, like, what, what what's going on? Um, but it, it was certainly a whirlwind. And, and then it was crazy because that was Monday. And I guess I stayed through Monday, did the press conference, and it was either Monday night or Tuesday. I flew back to Oklahoma because I wanted. We were getting ready to. Uh, we had one more game, and then I guess we were playing in the uh, Big Twelve Championship as well. And I wanted to finish that out with the guys as well. Wow. So it was tough because I'm trying to, you know, balance this job along with Oklahoma. And it was a little bit easier because. Uh, because of COVID, nobody was able to go out on the road recruiting it. Yeah. because it was a dead period because of mm -hmm. COVID. So it wasn't like I would have been in, in homes recruiting. Mm -hmm. I would do my as much Oklahoma stuff during the day as I could and, or that I needed to get that done. And then the rest of the day and the night was, yeah. was, was uh, you know, I mean, I can remember sitting in my office in Norman, Oklahoma and talking to potential coaches, talking to recruits, uh, just a, a lot of stuff going on for sure. During that six hour interview in, yeah. the, in the hotel room in Atlanta, you mm -hmm. said it was? Atlanta, yeah. What, what, uh, first of all, what, why was it in Atlanta? And then also what, what goes on in the six hour hotel room interview? Yeah. They just, are you, is it, are you whiteboard talking? Is it philosophy? Is it? No, it uh, great question. I guess it was in Atlanta because that was a central meeting point. You know how it is with a lot of these searches. Everybody tries to track Secret planes <laughs> and, and, and all this stuff. And there was all these, there were some rumors that had come out. I remember that we had, that we had interviewed in Oklahoma city or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, that never happened at all. So actually what, what we were going to do is Oklahoma was scheduled to play uh, West Virginia. Uh, that weekend, I think. And that game got postponed because of COVID or canceled because of COVID. And initially we were going to meet in Morgantown, West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, on the Friday night before the, uh, before the West Virginia, Oklahoma game. And thankfully it didn't because that would have been probably a two hour interview because that <laughs> would have been on a Friday night. So when that game got postponed, we just, uh, shifted and, and, I didn't really talk about where we were going. They just said, <laughs> they just can you, you can you be in Atlanta um, <laughs> yeah. on the Friday after Thanksgiving at whatever time? So flew into Atlanta and we checked into a hotel and just sat in a hotel suite, you know, for six hours. It was myself and Ray Tanner, our athletic director, and Chance Miller, who's our deputy athletic director, the three of us. Uh, our president here at South Carolina at the time, he was actually in quarantine because of COVID. So I did a Zoom with him. Okay. Um, and I'll never forget, <laughs> he uh, – uh, it was the same day that Iowa State was playing at Texas, the day after Thanksgiving, and it was a great game. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing my interview with the president, who's awesome. He's a football guy. And he's sitting there watching the end of the Iowa State-Texas game <laughs> while he's interviewing me. <laughs> and I knew what he was doing, so I was interested too because that was a yeah. Big 12 team, and I'm in the Big 12. So we were kind of talking. He was giving me the rundown of the end of that game. Had a great visit with him. And then the rest of the day, I would say it was primarily philosophy. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think um, – I was interviewing for a head coaching position. I don't know if they were as interested in whether I could – yeah. Talk about our run game versus a three four <laughs> defense or whatever, you know, yeah. or or talk about how you're gonna play cover three mm -hmm. or something like that. It was more them wanting to see can you be the CEO, can you be the face of the program, um, coaching staff, guys that you have in mind, mm -hmm. who you would want to hire, what does your offense look like, what does your defense look like, special teams, recruiting philosophy. I mean, you name it, everything from a philo yeah. philosophical standpoint, that's what we did. And 
it was uh it flew by i mean it really did it was it was six hours and i never got up one time i mean i kid <laughs> coach tanner or my boss that he never gave me a bathroom break he <laughs> yeah. never fed That's me a long time man. i mean i literally just <laughs> sat down and i felt like i got interrogated but it was great it was a very easy conversation yeah. but i think i had two bottles of water never got up once and and we just sat in there and and, and did the interview but same thing when i walked out of that i felt you know really really good about it yeah. that and i had known <clears throat> coach tanner our athletic director, he was the baseball coach here at South Carolina when I was an assistant football coach. Yeah. He won two national championships as the baseball coach. He's fantastic because he's a sports guy. He gets it. Um, and, and, and Chance is fantastic as well. So it was a very, uh, very easygoing conversation, but felt confident about what I was talking about. And again, it was something that <clears throat> um, I had been on other interviews before and i know it sounds crazy but every interview that i'd been on before um there was always like this end goal of ending up here at south south carolina you know and, and i'll be honest there are jobs that i interviewed in the for in the past that i remember saying to my wife you know does this this if this school were to offer this job does this get us closer to hopefully coming back to south carolina one day yeah. and uh so it was very uh, stressful because it's one of those, man, this is something my wife and I've been talking Dream. about for 10 plus years. <laughs> yeah. Don't screw this up, Shane, <laughs> as well. But again, um, I had great passion and confidence about uh, what I was talking about. Yeah. You, you said you've interviewed, for, you've probably done a bunch of interview, interviews during your assistant coaching career, mm -hmm. trying to get become a head coach. Is there one interview that sticks out in your mind as like the toughest one or, or, the, or a head coach that just was, <laughs> was, was brutal in the interview process? Um... No, I'll be honest with like the very first time, the very first time I had probably like a real interview for a job was 2007 when Nick Saban got the Alabama job mm -hmm. and um, he interviewed me for a position on his staff. I guess it would have been tight ends and tight ends and special teams. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, I really hadn't been on an interview. Um, I was a graduate assistant at Tennessee. Uh, Sylvester Croom got the Mississippi State job. Uh, I got hired at Mississippi State as an assistant coach on the field. And that really wasn't, uh, I think Coach Croom, like me, wanted to hire yeah, me. He knew you. He yeah. knew me. Uh, the person that had recommended me was Coach Croom's offensive coordinator, Woody McCorvey. He's at Clemson now. Uh, so I had enough people in my corner. And then the defensive coordinator was Ellis Johnson. And Ellis Johnson, I had known him. He had played for my dad at the Citadel back in the 70s. <laughs> so there was a lot of natural ties. So it wasn't so much an interview as it was just making sure this is the right fit for everybody. So the first real, real, real interview I ever went on was Nick Saban gets hired at <laughs> Alabama as the head coach. And I'm one of the first guys that he interviews for a job. Uh, so if you can – you can handle your first interview being with Coach Saban. Um, um, I think you can handle anything. And it wasn't so much uh, intense as it was. I mean, this is a big deal. This is Nick Saban coming yeah. back to the SEC, being the head coach at Alabama. Um, and one of the initial interviews is is me. Now, I didn't get it. He didn't offer me the job. And I went back to Mississippi State. And and uh, actually, I'll take it back. We went back to Mississippi State and then got offered the South Carolina job about a month later mm -hmm. uh, as well. So it's funny how things, you know, work out for yeah. sure. But yeah, that was that was one that you look back on. You're like, okay, you interview with Nick Saban, your first real interview. <laughs> uh, you can handle anything. No doubt. How, during your, your career as an assistant, you know, you hear a lot of coaches say, like, I was preparing for this moment. Yeah. And, and you, you've said a couple of times, and it sounds cliche, but I'm curious to hear, like, how actually were you preparing? Were you compiling your coach's mm -hmm. manual when you were doing that? Were mm -hmm. you taking things from different coaches, taking things from your dad? Yeah. Well, what were you doing to prepare for this? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, uh, probably when I was not probably, I know it was when I was here at South Carolina before as an assistant coach, I just kind of started keeping like a, a binder of notes and, um, uh, Kim Fields, who's our assistant director of operations here at Carolina right now. She was at South Carolina when I was an assistant coach and she actually helped me, you know, put it together. Wow. And it's just, a at the time it was just a black binder of just tabs and it was everything that you could think of that you would have to uh, deal with as a head coach. Um, the training room, team travel, uh, bowl games, uh, ideas for practice, um, motivation, dealing with the losing streak, turning over, turning a program around. I mean, you name it. I had it, uh, I had a section and it was really just, if I ever, 
if I read something in a book or it was something that we had done in another program, I just wrote it down, yeah. you know, as ideas to kind of refer back to and uh, as far as ideas and things like that to refer back to um, as I go th went through my career. And I used a lot of it as an assistant coach, just like motivation things and, and stuff like that. But um, that was probably the biggest thing, just kind of compiling that. And then as, it, as I got older and things became more and more serious with jobs, it was like, okay, Shane, you need more than just a, a notebook <laughs> of just ideas. Like we really need to kind of put together like your philosophy of what you would want, um, what you would want your program to, to, to be about uh, from a practice schedule standpoint. And, and I would say at that, it was really narrowing down on that but then are also being around a lot of coaches that i just took things from i mean i've taken from every coach that i've been around but most recently before i got the south carolina job was with lincoln riley who first time head coach um uh, he got hired in in the summertime i came in following that season so i was with him really for his first true off season so that was really beneficial before that i was with kirby smart at georgia uh, first time head coach. I came in with him year one. So I got to see a lot of how he yeah. implemented things his first year. And then before that was with my dad, you know, so That's took a lot. Good ones. <laughs> yeah. So I took from everybody, but it was really, really beneficial for me that I was around two first time head coaches, the most recent, the, the two most recent jobs yeah. before I came back and just kind of narrowing down what I would want this program to, to, to be about uh, or what a program that I was the head coach be about. So that's essentially what it was, just taken from every coach that I've been around and, and uh, really, you can't, to me, you can't, you can't um, necessarily steal from somebody, mm -hmm. but I think there's certain things that you take, whether it be from practice or quotes, sayings, philosophies that you tweak and kind of make your own, if that makes sense. What was it like growing up around your dad? Mm -hmm. He was obviously one of the biggest legends in, in college football. And how do you use him now as a, as a resource? <clears throat> Excuse me. Is, you know, the balance of wanting to use him as a resource, but also wanting to have your own program and your own yeah. philosophy and not, and not rely on what you saw him do all the time. Yeah, for sure. It was great growing up. It was the best thing for me. Uh, obviously, Growing up around a locker room and, and being around football my entire life was awesome. And I was able to experience things that kids my age <laughs> yeah. don't get to. So that was that was amazing. But it was also good for me to see um, the highs and the lows of the profession and how um, – how what a thin line it is between winning and losing yeah. and he says that all the time as well i mean people think of virginia tech the way that it finished during his, at his career but you know people don't remember that it it took him till his seventh season at virginia tech to get to a bowl game mm -hmm. and yeah. in his fifth season i mean he had losing seasons in 87 his first year was 87 for, he had a losing season in 87 losing season in 89 uh won six in 89 and 90 losing season in 91 and then he won two games in 92 so like today's time he would have been fired long before <laughs> yeah, never made the it. seventh <laughs> season or fifth season much less the seventh season yeah. um so that was good for me just to see kind of the highs and the lows of the profession and know what i was getting into and um so to be able to grow up his son then play for him in college and then coach for him it was great because i got to see kind of all sides mm -hmm. of uh of that position Still wasn't prepared for actually sitting in the chair myself, <laughs> but got to see a lot of it. And then now uh, it's a great resource to be able to reach out to uh, about anything. He he still lives in Virginia with my mom, and they're there at every home game and most of the away games. And people ask me how often I call him for advice and things like that. And I do, but not as often as you think. And it's a compliment because a lot of times – if I had a question and I needed to call him, I pretty much already know what he's going to tell me mm -hmm. already because I've I've seen how he's handled situations and things like that as well. But it's a great uh, great resource to have yeah. as a you know as a dad, as a former coach, uh, um, now as a granddad. Everything he's in he's in a great role. No, it's got to be a, just awesome awesome yeah. growing up around that, yeah, right? I mean, no that's question. a kid's dream. Uh, not only are you a first time head coach. But you also are a first-time head coach in the time that college football has probably changed the most it's yeah. ever changed, right? I mean, yeah. it's changed more in the last three years than mm -hmm. it has in probably 100 years. Yeah. NIL, transfer portal, I mean, yeah. everything you're dealing with. How has that played into navigating your first time experience? And the, maybe the benefit is everyone's figuring it out, figuring it out together while, yeah. while you're a first time head coach. Yeah, no, I think that's it because we're all experiencing it yeah. for the first time. And um, 
Uh, there's no, that's one thing I can't like call my dad about because <laughs> he didn't, he didn't, hasn't experienced this NIL and transfer portal the way it is right now. And there's no, when I was compiling that binder of notes, no there NIL was no tab. section there, there was no NIL tab <laughs> for me to refer to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We didn't have that section yeah. in there back in 2007 or eight when I started compiling that book. Um, I think that's just it is, is we're all learning and, and each and every day, you just kind of take it day by day and figure out how to, you know, what's best for the South Carolina program and, and how to continue to make this program better, how to continue to, uh, help our student athletes in every which way that we can. And, and I don't spend a whole lot of time from a transfer portal, all that standpoint, worrying about things I can't control for me. It's every single day. And I tell our players and coaches this all the time. Every decision I make is going to be what I feel is best for the South Carolina football program, mm -hmm. South Carolina football team. And uh, to me, every single day, it's just making the decisions that uh, are best for this program, trying to make this program the very best that it possibly can be. And then, you know, uh, everything else kind of takes care of itself. How, how has the portal adjusted your strategy, though, from a head coaching standpoint? Number one, staff, mm -hmm. so your recruiting department. <clears throat> Um, scholarship allotment. Yeah. How, how has it changed that? It's changed it a lot. Uh, you got to be more flexible from a number standpoint. Uh, staff wise, certainly before it was watching nothing but high school guys. Now that you now you've certainly got to be aware and evaluate guys when they go in the portal. And it's tough too because you know this from being a student athlete. If you're getting recruited in high school, when Penn State was recruiting you, mm -hmm. they recruited you. I'm sure for three four years yeah. all throughout high school. Well. Guys that go in the portal, you may have 48 hours yeah. to decide yeah. if you want to offer them a scholarship yeah. and bring them into your program or not. And it's tough. Um, you know, you, guy goes in the portal, you're reaching out to his high school coach, his coaches at the college he's coming from. You're trying to find out as much about a person as you can. Uh, and and whether he you want whether he's the kind of person you want in your program, mm -hmm. but it's tough because you may just be trying to fight to get him on a visit because there's mm -hmm. 10 other schools doing the same thing. And, and that's tough. So you got to be really, really thorough and you got to have a great department to help with that. And a lot of people reaching out to people. So that goes back to, you know, the coaches that you hire and the relationships mm -hmm. they have with people and areas that you want to be recruiting, where are those ties? And then I think the biggest thing probably is just from a, from a number standpoint, you know, we only get 85 scholarships and, you know, five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, it was you have target position, target numbers that you want at each position in each recruiting cycle. I was just looking at it this morning in our staff room as far as, you know, we have every position and above that position, we have the number of guys that we want to sign at that year in that particular year, whether it be two running backs, six offensive linemen, one quarterback, whatever it might be. Whereas in the past, all that came from high school. Well, now uh, if on signing day you haven't, if you want to sign five offensive linemen and you haven't signed five high school offensive linemen, that's okay because you say, okay, well, now we're going to go to the portal and let's not have to necessarily reach and take a, take a high school offensive lineman that maybe quite isn't good enough. We don't have to do that. We'll try and find the other two positions from the portal, mm -hmm. if you will. So that, that's changed it from a little, from that standpoint, but certainly the roster turnover is extreme. I mean, every single year is different. When you when we start the spring semester in January, I mean, it's like a whole new team. Yeah. And when we played Notre Dame in the bowl game this year, I think on December 30th, and then a week and a half later, classes started. So we sat right here in this team meeting room. I mean, there's like so many new faces. <laughs> it's, it's the transfer portal guys. Yeah. It's the so more, more high school young men graduate high school early. So you've got a bunch of new students, new players that just arrived from high school, plus the guys that came in from the portal, and it's just like a new team, and it's crazy because just a week and a half earlier, you're sitting in the same room with a completely different team. So uh, it's harder to build a team. There's no question about it. you got to be even more intentional about that year to year, and then you just got to be more and more flexible with roster numbers because you really truly don't know – who your team is going to be yeah. until like now, the middle of May, as yeah. we tape this, because yeah. you've got a transfer portal window after spring practice where some guys may leave your program. Mm -hmm. You may bring some guys into your program. So really, and then you got the high school guys that haven't arrived yet that'll be getting here in June. Mm -hmm. 
you know, so really, you know who your team is going to be permanently or, or, or for, for sure in the middle of May, but you really don't get them all together until June. It's wild. Yeah. <laughs> a lot's changed. It is. When it comes to NIL, yeah. you hear all the stories about it, right? It's a big media topic. From your experience recruiting the last mm -hmm. couple of years, how much do players actually ask about NIL and talk about NIL and how much, I mean, portal versus high school, yeah. is it as prevalent as people think it is? That's a good question. Prevalent. It's prevalent. I don't know perception wise what it is. At least my conversations with guys directly, individually, one on one with them and their families. Very little, if at all, from a high school standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and this is honest to God and truth. In, in my time here, I've probably had three high school recruits or in their families sit in my office and bring up NIL. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the honest truth. Now, is it happening outside my office, other conversations with people? Probably. I don't know. But as far as directly with me, very, very little. And then my conversations with them, it's, it's you know, we're, at a, we're in the capital city, got an unbelievable fan base. There's tons of opportunities for you from a name, image, and likeness standpoint. I want our guys on our team to, to earn it. If you earn it, I'm all for it. And, um, um, and then can talk about what some of our other student athletes here at Carolina are, are doing from a name, image, and likeness standpoint. That's from a high school standpoint. From a transfer portal standpoint, a lot. It's a little different. <laughs> a lot. Um, <laughs> Um, a lot for sure. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. You, you got, you got some, some, some tape to back it up a little yeah, bit. You're in the portal. Just, you're in the portal. You, you get yeah, a little more you got, you got tape and, and I don't think, you know, certainly you got guys that are getting in the portal for, you know, for different reasons, but yeah. certainly, um, NIL for an established student athlete, not just in football, but any sport, yeah. you know, let's be real. We, we, we know what's going on out there. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you've always been known as a great recruiter. What's a, a recruiting battle in your career as an assistant or maybe now that you lost that still haunts you to this day? Oh, man. Um, there's so many because you feel like you – I mean, really, you lose more guys than yeah, you get. And, um, I mean, you're going to offer more players every single year that that you don't get. Wow. Um, you know, when – Probably when I was here before as an assistant coach at South Carolina, I mean, there was a great run of just really good football players coming out of the state of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And literally the, the same – around the same time you had um, – you had all the players that came here to South Carolina, guys like Alshon Jeffrey and Stephon Gilmore and Marcus Lattimore and right after him, Jadavion Clowney. Yeah. And, I mean, on and on and on. But – People forget during that same time, uh, Robert Quinn was from the state of South Carolina. <clears throat> Robert went to North Carolina. And A.J. Green was from the state of South Carolina and went to Georgia. Mm -hmm. And Robert and A.J. and Alshon are all from within probably an hour mm -hmm. of each other. And, uh, you know, I got hired a little bit late and uh, – Robert and AJ, I really wasn't involved in their recruitment, but I always think about, man, like we had a great run at South Carolina, but just imagine if we had been able to keep <laughs> Robert Quinn and yeah. AJ Green to stay here at South Carolina, you know, how, uh, how good, how good that would have been. And then probably the ones that hurt the most um, were guys, you know, when I was at Virginia Tech, it's different because that, that's my alma mater. Mm. I was coaching for my dad. I was passionate about the place and I and I loved the place. And anytime a guy chose to go somewhere else, particularly if they were from the state of Virginia, yeah. that hurt. And, uh, and, it, and it was personal. So I think any of those that I recruited at Virginia Tech and and didn't get guys that I recruited directly and had relationships with, and we lost guys to um we lost guys to Penn State, we lost guys to Clemson, we lost guys to um Michigan, we lost guys to uh, even Duke, mm -hmm. North Carolina. You know, those are the ones that a, a young man from Virginia that didn't come to Virginia Tech. I just remember <laughs> thinking, well, why? Now yeah. as a head coach of South Carolina, that's great. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we recruit a lot of guys from Virginia. Yeah. I get it. So come on yeah. down to Columbia. But probably those just because you don't want to let your dad down. Yeah. And uh, anybody that I recruited at Tech that I didn't get, that that hurt. Yeah. 
I, I've I listened to a few of your other interviews you've done, and and you mentioned <laughs> the word love a mm -hmm. lot, which is sometimes somewhat rare for a college football head yeah. coach to talk about love as much as you do. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Like, how, how did that get ingrained as part of your philosophy? And what does that really mean to you? Yeah, to me, it's um, it's not always just a hunky dory walking around and and hugging everybody up and, and saying we love you. It's um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, we truly it, love is being honest. Love is mm -hmm. telling you the truth, and and sometimes it may not be what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear, and uh, it, it it is something that we're very um passionate about here at Carolina. And it just kind of goes back to when I was thinking about what I wanted this program to be about. Uh, you know, we have core values and those are all things that, that, that I came up with and, mm -hmm. and love was, you know, right there at the top. Um, and we try and embody that each and every day. And, and I get it. It's harder than ever nowadays with the transfer portal and NIL to, um, to build a team. But, I got into this profession for, you know, I love to compete and love the game, but really the relationships with the players. And I love that. When I was an assistant coach, I uh, felt like I was super connected and super close with all the guys on the team. And and now I get to do that as a head coach. And I love that part of it, of the job. I'm, I'm not a guy that sits in my office all day and isn't seen in the building. Like I want to be out and about and around this facility at all times. And involved in our players lives and to me that is that is love and and um um you know you you're right you don't hear a lot in in football mm -hmm. particularly but you know we use we say the word love around here a lot and guys say i love you uh, a lot and i've told the story before i mean one of the coolest moments we had in 2021 my first season was we got the crap kicked out of us by texas a and m and and uh out in college station on a saturday night and game ends you talk to the team in the locker room you got to go do the post-game press conference then you go do the post-game radio show with your radio network then we do a weekly tv show that i got to tape so you're doing all this and now you're like man i got a two-hour flight back to columbia south carolina we're going to get back at four o'clock in the morning or whatnot and i remember i was with my wife and we were walking back into the locker room after the uh, tv show and uh to carry on joiner who was uh, one of our players still here in the program you know, he was coming the other direction and I was going to stop and just kind of give him like one of the, you know, bro hugs and all that. And he stopped me and he goes, no, stop. He go, and he looked him right in the eye, looked at me right in the eye. And he, he said, stop, I love you. And we're going to get this thing right. And for him to say that in that moment, like I'll never forget that. And that was one of the coolest moments and a moment of adversity that we faced in 2021. And, and he was right. Uh, I mean, we, we flew back to, Flew back to uh, Columbia. We had an off week the next week, and then the very next game we beat Florida uh, here in Columbia by three touchdowns and a when we were like three touchdown underdogs, mm -hmm. I think. And um, um, it was at that moment I remember thinking to myself, okay, you know, we got the right kind of guys in this program, and and they're uh, they're 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 they believe in what we're doing here, and we're going to be okay. Uh, I want to ask you about Spencer Rattler, and yeah. and he's really <clears throat> hit a new level in his career since he's been here. What have you seen from him? What's maybe uh, that's gone into him making those strides and, yep. and, you know, getting to the point where he is now? Yeah. You know, I'll go back to Spencer and I were together at Oklahoma yep. for, uh, for a couple of years, I guess Spencer's freshman year, he was behind Jalen hurts mm -hmm. and uh, we won a big 12 championship. He got to see Jalen hurts come in from Alabama and transfer in and how he handled that situation. And then people forget that, Early in Spencer's career as the starting quarterback at Oklahoma, he dealt with some adversity. Like yeah. he started out, we started out 0 and 2 in the Big 12 mm -hmm. in 2020 with Spencer as our starting quarterback, and that doesn't happen at Oklahoma. You're not yeah. supposed to lose a conference game, much less back to back True. to start the year. And we lost to uh, Kansas State at home, mm -hmm. and then we lost to Iowa State on the road, yeah. and then we play Texas in Dallas. And Coach Riley takes him out of the game in the first half because he wasn't playing well. Mm -hmm. He puts him back in in the second half. We beat Texas, I think, in four overtimes. Don't lose a game the rest of the year. Win the Big 12. Uh, Florida or uh, Beat Florida in the Cotton Bowl. Spencer's preseason Heisman, mm -hmm. preseason number one pick, all this stuff. And then uh, 2021 doesn't go the way that he wants it to go. So – he had dealt with adversity before, and I knew him as a person. So I knew what we were getting when we brought him in here. And that's what I've seen, uh, a guy that's dealt with adversity before and and got, uh, 
uh, was became stronger because of it. A guy that is a uh, really good teammate um, and a super talented guy. That's a great person. First and foremost, comes from a great family. And I think the biggest thing I've seen with him that's grown is just his comfort level here, his confidence in what we're doing, confidence in himself has continued to grow, and um, and then just leadership. You know, I really feel like last year at this time, he hadn't played a game at South Carolina and he was yeah. still learning what was going on and learning his teammates. And now I think he's very uh, he, he's very comfortable. He's very confident. His leadership skills have grown. And, um, you know, I'm excited to see what he does in 20, 2023. And, and he took a lot. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but he took a lot of, you know, crap. You know this when you yeah. when you don't play well, the head coach, the offensive coordinator and the quarterback get the brunt of the criticism. <laughs> and he'll be the first to tell you he didn't play great at all times last year but <clears throat> but he also when people talked about spencer rattle or struggling well he was struggling while he was technical while he was struggling while he was leading us to south carolina's first win ever over texas a and m south carolina's first win over kentucky uh up in lexington in like 10 years so we accomplished a lot before all of a sudden he really started playing great there at the end of the season yeah that's what i was going to ask you is I, I feel like with spencer for whatever reason, there was somewhat of a negative connotation around him as a quarterback when he left Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. But I, do you feel like that's shifted a lot? And is that? <clears throat> in, it sounds like you've seen very different from that from from what people were saying about him when when he when yeah. He left OU. I think um, I think some people maybe came up with the negative connotation because of the uh, whatever show he did on Netflix yeah. or whatever it was when he was in <laughs> high school, which I've never watched. Yeah. But if you did a show on me as a 16 or 17 year old, I'd probably yeah, look like good. a complete idiot. <laughs> uh, so I've never watched it. And if yeah. anybody's basing an opinion of Spencer Rattler off that TV show, then, then that God help you. Cause a show <laughs> can make you look any way they want you to look. I saw the kind of teammate in person uh, Spencer was at Oklahoma. So I knew that. And, you know, he took criticism, which I wasn't in Norman that season, but I don't understand it. I mean, one, when he got benched, and again, I don't know what in, what, what went into the decision to to bench him for uh, for Caleb Williams, but he was undefeated as a quarterback that season. And he got benched during the Texas game where the punt team got a punt blocked by yeah. Texas that day. The defense at Oklahoma couldn't stop anybody that day. I've, I've watched the replay of the game, and he didn't play great, and I get it. Lincoln put him in the game to kind of give the team a spark, and Caleb mm -hmm. played great, and they stayed with it, and, and the rest is history with yeah. Caleb and whatnot. But it wasn't like Spencer had gone out there that day against Texas, and they had a bad team going into the game. They were undefeated and ranked in the top five, <laughs> yeah. and the team didn't play that great that day. But when you're the quarterback, sometimes the head coach feels like he's got to make a change, and, and he did. But – I only watched um, I only watched a little bit of uh, Oklahoma on television after that day, mm -hmm. but I don't think he necessarily became a bad teammate after he lost his job. From what <laughs> I saw, he continued to be yeah. supportive of Caleb and and uh, and handle things uh, with class. And I talked to people at Oklahoma before we brought him out here about that were in the program about Spencer mm -hmm. and um, and. No one had a negative thing to say. It was all positive about the way he handled things. And and I know he still hears from people at Oklahoma, and I still hear from people at Oklahoma that, you know, reach out to me that are pulling for him out here. Last couple of things I got for you. I know I'm probably over oh, my good. time my time a lot. Oh, no, you're here, fine. But, <laughs> but, um, I enjoy you know how these keep, things keep, go. We just we just keep going. It keeps me from all the other stuff that I gotta do. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the one thing that's been cool to watch you in, in this program is how you've embraced social media mm -hmm. content. You've done some of the different like yeah. music video stuff and yeah. going viral on social media. Where, where does that come from? Is that part of uh, like your philosophy and and what's made you so open to that? Like doing stuff like this. Yeah. Like, a couple of years ago, you'd never see a head coach right. sitting down for an hour on a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one, it's me. I enjoy people and, yeah. and enjoy, I, I enjoy getting to know people and, and uh, talking about our program as well. Uh, two, let's face it. I mean, South Carolina doesn't have the tradition, if you will, of yeah. other programs where if I'm the head coach at a certain school, you may not have to market your program or market yourself. I mean, people didn't know who I was when I got this job. Um, so you have to, people have to get to know you. 
And I think in today's time with social media and the way recruiting is and the transfer portal, um, the more that you can, I don't want to say talk about yourself, but the more people see you yeah. and you're visible, the better. And people are talking about South Carolina football. And yes, it's because of uh, what we did on the field last season and what we've done in recruiting. But I also realize it's because we did the office spoof mm -hmm. and it's because I did a <laughs> soldier boy video yeah. last year on the day before SEC media day. And, um, and that's a good thing, you know, and I get it. We need to win football games. Like if we don't win football games and then all that stuff as well, if we hadn't been spending all that time doing, <laughs> doing office soldier spoofs, boy. saying <laughs> soldier boy, they would have won the game. So I get it, you know, yeah. right now, because we've been successful, it's a positive thing, but I think it's that just one, it's my personality. Um, I enjoy this part of the job. Two, it's I want to market our program and let people see the great things, the great things that are going on in this program and the great people mm -hmm. in this program as well. And and show that, yeah, we're having a lot of fun here at Carolina. And and it's not easy being a football player in this program. I mean, it's 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 hard and it's hard work and it's demanding and uh, you know, accountability is accountability is a core value in this program and you're gonna be held accountable, but uh, I want there to be, going back to your question about love a minute ago, I want there to be love and joy. I want our guys to be excited when they come in this building each and every day. They do know it's not. They know it's going to be hard, but I want them to look forward to coming in here each day. Do recruits bring up the videos at all? Do they, they ever do. mention, mention all the, the soldier boy? And the, all the time. <laughs> they love I, it. Had, I had one a couple, uh, about, a, about two or three months ago, I had one that visited and he pulled out his phone and it was actually like the, the screensaver was the picture <laughs> of me with the sunglasses and the soldier boy video. Like that was actually one of his phone. Oh. I'm like, wow. Um, and probably, um, uh, we got a great creative media team and, and, um, uh, any ideas they have, I know are going to be brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then I've, I'll be honest with you. I've, I probably underestimated just the impact of, some of those videos and how many people see them. Yeah. Um, you know, you do a video and you're like, okay, cool. You know, it'll <laughs> be fun for social media. But I probably early on didn't realize the impact of them. Like we did the Soldier Boy video literally 30 minutes before I got on a plane to fly to Atlanta to go to SEC Media Day last year. Uh, we did the video. We They posted it 15, 10 minutes after we did it. I got in the car to ride to the airport when it goes out on social media and I bet you within five, 10 minutes, I mean, I've got 30 text messages on my phone <laughs> from recruits. They're like, yeah. Oh my God, coach, this is amazing. <laughs> and then even the office thing uh, that we did, the office spoof a couple, uh, a month or so ago, I mean, people are still bringing that up yeah. and people that didn't even watch the office think it's awesome because they see me out there running and racing <laughs> and things like that. So uh, recruits bring it up all the time and our fans like it. And, um, and, and certainly recruits bringing up a lot. That's great. I love it. Yeah, it's, been, yeah. it's been fun seeing it. Uh, what what are the one or two things that have to happen for this place to get to where you want it to be? SEC championships, playing yeah. for national championships. Yeah. Uh, I know it's simple, but we just got to continue to recruit and develop mm -hmm. depth. Um, you know, we're getting there, but our depth isn't where it needs to be at, at every position. Um, we're, we're, uh, you're, you're full of depth all across the board. We're not there yet um so we need to continue to recruit and, and develop depth at uh at, at all positions without a doubt and and then to me as we just continue to be very forward thinking in everything that we do as a program and and, and as a university and as an administration i mean we've got we've got great facilities here we've got a great stadium home field environment all that as well but we can't just think, okay, we got what we need and we've arrived yeah. and take a breath. We've, we, we, there's no complacency. And I've challenged our players and coaches uh, this season, this off season in 2023, find better ways of doing things. Like we just can't assume that because things went well in 2022, that it's just automatically going to happen in 2023. Like be better, me be better as a head coach, find better ways of doing things in every department in here. And to me, that's the biggest thing is we just we don't get comfortable. We don't get complacent, which we won't. And we continue yeah. to grow. We continue to move this program forward as a university and as an athletic department. And then us as a football program as well. And then recruit. It's all about recruiting. Yeah, right? it is always. <laughs> it's all about the players. Um, <clears throat> last thing. I like to end with this question and, and hear your answer. What's your why? What's the reason that you do what you do, that you're – the head coach of South Carolina and, and, you know, work in the work until midnight, some nights and yeah. grinding the way that you do. I just love seeing, um, I love seeing young people 
uh, be successful. Um, being able to recruit a 17 year old young man, get to know him in high school, see him come to Carolina, struggle, deal with adversity, but end up having a great career, mm -hmm. graduate. Later on, I get invited to their wedding and then they have children. I love that part of it. Like I, I love coaching and competing, but just the relationship part of the job, probably just that. Um, being around young people keeps me young, seeing them be successful. It gives me an opportunity to compete. And then my family, you know, my faith and my family are very important to me. And I've got a wife and three amazing kids and and I'm fortunate that I'm in a profession where I'm able to include my family and a lot of the stuff that we do here at Carolina and our coaches can do include their families as well. So being able to uh, uh, have them feel like they're a part of what we're doing, which they are, is certainly a big part of my why. And then love, uh, just love seeing young people be successful. I love it. Well, coach, I appreciate all your time. I know it's been a, been a long interview and I know it's hard to get coaches to sit down for an hour. So, uh, but I'm excited for people to see it and, and get to know you a little bit. And, and uh, I'm excited to see you guys, you know, hopefully win an SEC championship soon yeah. and, and get this place where you want it to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. Well, thanks for coming down. I uh, appreciate what you're doing. Thanks for coming to Columbia, appreciate Columbia, it. South Carolina to visit with us. Thanks coach. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you.